<laughs> right. <laughs> uh, over to you, Angela. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Helen, for inviting me um, to do this. You'll have to excuse me if I've got my head down uh, quite a bit because I do have to read what, uh, what I've written. So I was just going to start off by telling you a little bit about how I got to know L.S. Lowry. So it's a bit about myself, really. Um, I went to university in Leeds and then, to, and then did a postgraduate course at Salford. And then in August 1967, I started working at the University of Salford, living in Eccles. I wasn't an academic. I was working in the university administration. Salford at that time was very different from how it is today. The area around the university was still full of streets with small terraced houses and going up Broad Street there were still cobbles. It felt quite strange to me as I'd spent most of my life living in the countryside and the part of Leeds I'd lived in when I, when I was at university was very leafy and green. <coughs> Excuse me. However, in the middle of the Salford University campus was the Salford Museum and Art Gallery, where at that time the extensive collection of paintings and drawings by L.S. Lowry was housed. I didn't know much about Lowry at that time, but spent many lunch times in the gallery and got to love his work, which really reflected some of the places I saw around the university. Well, after a few years, the novelty of working for a living wore off and I was looking for something else in addition. I thought I'd like to know more about Lowry. So I was fortunate through an acquaintance at the university, I met the then director of the art gallery and asked him, feeling very cheeky, if he could arrange for me to meet Mr. Lowry as I wanted to write about him. I didn't have any very clear ideas about what this would mean an MA, an article, a book. Well, I thought that was far too ambitious for me. Anyway, <clears throat> surprisingly, the answer came back that Mr. Lowry would be willing to meet me. We met first briefly at the art gallery, and then I embarked on a series of visits to his home at the Elms in Mottram in Longdendale. This was 1972, when I was 27 and I'd bought my first car a few months earlier. I borrowed a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and so my visits began. Mr. Lowry, who was born in 1887, was then 85. I continued seeing him until early 1976, just before he died in February, aged 88. I recorded over 20 hours of conversations about his life and thoughts. As you'll hear in the extracts, he often spoke tongue in cheek and was very guarded about certain aspects of his life. He was a very private person. He had a sense of humor and I know that he didn't always tell me the truth about things whether that was because he was then quite old, or, but I don't think it was. I just think that certain sometimes he didn't want to reveal things about himself. Anyway, somehow he seemed to enjoy my company, as indeed he did young women in general. And we became kind of friends, really. So, before I tell you about Lowry's life and you listen to extracts of our conversations, I thought I'd set the scene and describe briefly his sitting room in which I met him. There are two large armchairs around the brick fireplace, which has an electric fire. A large dining table and chairs with Mr. Lowry's filing system. A wide china bowl in which correspondence is placed. What strikes me are the pictures around the room, as well as the large number of clocks. I believe there were 14, including a grandfather clock, all set to different times. You, you will be able to hear the clocks chiming and ticking in some of the conversation extracts. The pictures on the walls include his own work, the portraits of his parents, 
a drawing of his mother sewing, which you'll see later on, a painting of the boats at Lytham St Anne's, drawings by Rossetti and Ford Maddox Brown, a Rossetti painting of the head of a woman, he owned 17 works by Rossetti, and a drawing of Anne. Larry said Anne was his godchild, but she may have been an imagined character because nobody's ever really found out who she was. In addition, there were many small sculptures around, including one of a cat and some of ballet dancers. So to start with, we're, go we're going to listen to um, a, the first extract. And you'll see that it, it doesn't necessarily fo follow on exactly from what I've, I've, I've been saying, but it will give you a flavour of what it was like. And then I'll talk a bit about his early life. Thanks, Bernard. Now what have you got for me? Yeah. Have you got all the new questions? Yes. Good God! Go on. Oh yes. Can you, can you tell me about when you sold your first painting? Yes, I sold it in an exhibition in Manchester in 1921. Of Bastel. What, what's up? If you want to see the picture, would you like to see the picture? Yes. Will it do you good to see the picture? Yes. Which is so for that girl called Rodrigo's. Oh Logic. no, it's at Lee now, in an exhibition at Lee. No, I think that's, that's a fight, isn't it? There's a fight outside. But a man's trying on, trying on a hat. Um, a man's pulling a hat over somebody else's head, isn't he? Yes, yes, I like that. Do you like that one? Yes. I saw that, you know. You saw it? Yeah. In Salford? No, in, uh, in when, uh, where was it? Angel Meadow. Long since gone. Where's that? It's long, near the cathedral, but long since gone. It's called Angel Meadow. Angel Meadow. It sounds very beautiful. It was beautiful, yeah. Goings on in Angel Meadow. Really? Yeah. Did you start selling a lot of paintings I after did that? I did so very few. I sold out of the area. I didn't think I sold another for about five years. Did it bother you? Or? No. Nothing bothered me. When, did, when would you say you started selling a lot of paintings? Uh, about 1950 odd. Was that after the exhibition in London? Uh, about that, about, yes, about that time it began to suddenly start to work up a bit. Did you think of yourself being a painter? I didn't know whether I'd succeed or not. But you wanted to do that? Well, yes, I think so, yes. 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 What about your ambitions to go into business? Well, that would have happened if I'd not been... I don't know what kept me on painting. Something did. Something kept me on. I don't know what it was. And I kept on, you see? Yeah. I kept on. There we are. Yeah, I'm 84. Still the... painting? No. Uh, don't you do some? I do. No, you can't paint in my time of life. Bastard, you can't, and you've done it all before. Because a lot, a lot of people rebel against their parents, what, when they're young. Did you ever? Feel no, like I this? never did. I was a home bird all the time. I never had a girl. I never was in love. I knew a lot of people. I drifted along and drifted along until I'm drifting now, and you're talking to me. I've been, <laughs> been a drifter. <laughs> I've been a drifter, you see. Oh, yeah. Why do you think you'd be like that? It's my makeup. Because you like, you like... The makeup? Yes. Yeah. Did you ever think of living away from home? No, never. Your parents? Never. No, I didn't dare to my head. So I'll say something about his early life, which some of you might know, you, may, you probably will know some of this, but it's useful. So Lawrence Stephen Lowry was born in Stratford, the only child of Robert Stephen, a Northern Irish-born estate agent, and Elizabeth, a concert pianist and piano teacher who came from a family of hatters in Manchester. Before her marriage, Elizabeth had given several concerts in Manchester and she had been asked to become a professional pianist. However, she had declined this offer, preferring to play for her friends and herself. Larry said he had a great admiration for this decision, often relating to me stories of other musicians and painters 
who wish to remain amateur and not take their talents too seriously. This provides a clue to Mr. Lowry's attitude to the art world. In our conversations, he stated a preference for paintings of amateurs. I like an amateur show better than a professional show, he said. You never know what you're going to see in an amateur show. To return to his early life, we understand that his was a difficult birth and his mother, who had been hoping for a girl, was uncomfortable even, even looking at him at first. Later, she expressed her envy of her sister Mary, who had three splendid daughters instead of one clumsy boy. After Larry's birth, his mother's health was too poor for her to continue teaching. After a few years, the family moved to Rusholm, which was then a pleasant residential suburb. Larry attended Victoria Park School, a private school long since disappeared. His mother was controlling and intolerant of failure. She used illness as a means of securing the attention and obedience of her mild and affectionate husband, and she dominated her son in the same way. Larry was isolated as a child with few friends of his age. He said that he did not particularly enjoy his childhood. <coughs> he told me that he played football regularly up to the age of 17, but then gave it up as I couldn't see the point of it. He didn't pass any exams at school and claimed not to have had any ideas about a career. His father apparently did not want him to join his estate agent's business. He didn't think much of me, my father, Mr. Larry would chuckle. I don't know why. His father was affectionate towards him, but Larry could not gain the approval he craved from his mother. Some of you may have seen the portrayal of the relationship between him and his mother in last year's film, Mr. Lowry. In 1904, at the age of 17, he started work as a clerk with a Manchester Chartered Accountant. And then he was employed as a clerk for the General Accident Fire and Life Assurance Company in 1907. Mr. As I said earlier, Mr. Lowry was a very private person in, in all our conversations, never revealed that he had worked in commerce. He talked about his drawings and paintings as a child, but said that his family had not thought much of them at the time. He told me that it was suggested that he take up art as he wasn't fit for anything else. An aunt had remembered, he said, that he had drawn little ships when he was eight years old and suggested to his mother that he should enrol at the Municipal College of Art, now part of Manchester Poly uh, Manchester Metropolitan University and so he did in 1905 for evening classes in antique and freehand drawing. When his aptitude became apparent he took life studies under the Frenchman Pierre Adolphe Vallette, some of whose paintings you'll have seen in Manchester Art Gallery and also started private art classes with the American portrait painter William Phipps who lived on Alexandra Road. He remained at the Municipal College as a part-time student until 1915 and also took evening classes at Salford School of Art until 1925. Thus, his attendance at classes spanned some 20 years. So you can see why he was irritated by people who thought he was an amateur painter, self-taught and untutored. He said, if people call me a Sunday painter, I'm a Sunday painter who paints every day of the week. Larry was well aware of trends in modern art then, how French Impressionism had, for example, changed the paintings of landscapes in the modern city. He dip, deeply admired pre-Raphaelites such as Rossetti and Ford Maddox Brown. And as I saw when I visited, he had his own wonderful collection of pre-Raphaelite paintings and drawings. Villette, his teacher, painted the industrial scene of Manchester in the Impressionist style. 
Mr. Lowry claimed that he disliked Ballet's style of painting and the Impressionists in general. However, it is possible to see his influence in Lowry's work, particularly in the scenes of boats and yachts at Lytham St Anne's, where the Lowry family spent their holidays. After Mr. Lowry's death in 1976, it was revealed that from 1904 to 1952, he was in full-time employment. From 1910 onwards, this was with the Pall Mall Property Company as a rent collector and clerk, and you saw the photograph just then. This was known only to his closest friends, and he only hinted about this work saying that he enjoyed the counting house. He also said that his best friends were businessmen who often said, oh, why don't you give up this art and come and join us? And in all our conversations, he never told me about, about his work. So Bernard, we'll listen to the next bit. In a way, when you start when you started to paint the industrial scene, did it? It was something that came to you quite suddenly that you wanted to do it. Was it grew it? gradually. I, I I disliked it at first, and then I got used to it. And then I began to think there's something in it, and then I began to think there's a lot in it, and then I began to wonder whether anybody had ever done it seriously, and they found they hadn't seriously. Hard ones, you see. That was all. And then I decided to do it, and that's how it all happened. I painted portraits that nobody wanted, and landscapes that nobody wanted, and sea pieces that nobody wanted. But those were sidelines, you see. At first I painted portraits and landscapes that nobody wanted. And then I began the industrial scene, and people laughed at that. And then I... Did they really? Yeah, for 30 years. I think I asked you this before. Why did you paint the backs of taxis? <laughs> I don't know. I just did. I began to imagine it was a hearse and I was in it. A hearse? Yeah, it doesn't look like hearses. That's and I was, yes, I suppose. So. And I was in it, you see. And it seemed to derive, I derived great amusement from that fact. In some mysterious way. How long does it, did it usually take you to paint a picture? Well, it could take a, could take a year or more. Oh, yeah, it's because of all the little figures in them, you know, they very yeah. do a lot of doing. Do you usually, you know, stick to one painting? Oh, I have one. And then the days when I was active, I had 20 going at a time. Yeah. So you might just leave them? Oh, then. leave them for a time, yes, and go back to them. And add, add, add figures? And yes, that's it, that's it. You go to bed late? I go to bed, I get to bed gently. I like to be in bed by two. Two? Yeah. That's late, isn't it? Two to nine. Two to nine thirty are my hours in bed. It's quite long enough for a man of my age. And when I'm away from home, I go to bed at half past ten. Why is that? I don't know. <coughs> it just happens. Oh, yeah. What do you do until two o'clock? I don't know. Because the radio's not on, is oh, it? I don't listen to the radio very much. Coming in a house when you've been away and there's nobody in it, that's the time. Well, until you get in the house. Yes. Until you get in, then when you're out, you're all right. You never get used to that. That's true. Oh, you noticed that? Yes. When, wh what would you say was the happiest time of your life? From 1924 to 1932. Why was that? Because people are about who... And they're not about now, naturally. Times change. It was very nice. Nine twenty-four, nine thirty-two. That was when you first started painting. The oh industry. no, the painting didn't come into it really. <coughs> People I knew. Why did it end in nineteen thirty-two? Because say? the deaths began then. Did they? Yeah. My father died in nineteen thirty-two. Then one or two or five deaths in nineteen thirty-two. People I knew. Why, and why were you going to burn these? I was going to, to give it all up and fed up with it. When was that? Would you oh, think? I can't say when, a long time ago. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have a good bonfire and end it. <laughs> and my friends would have said, jolly good old job. 
<laughs> Come and join us. Yeah. Uh, and he said, what are you going to do with you? I'm going to burn them. Well, you mustn't do that, he said. You mustn't do that. Oh, he said, well, I am, you know, I said. So he said, no, I'll, I'll give you what I can for them, but don't do that, he said. It's not a drawing, they were drawings. So I said, you can take them away if you like. Get them out of my sight. <laughs> and he did. And they get worth a lot of money now. Yes. And he's got them. That's good. Yeah. My mother was like that, you know. Was she? She would never stop with friends. Well, perhaps you got it from her. Got it from her, yeah. Yeah. She was, I couldn't understand it in those days. But she wouldn't stop with friends. So if you went to see friends, you'd stay and stop in a hotel or something? I went to tell Nia and go across, they come across something, I'd go to them every day, wanting to see them. Nothing, oh my good lord, I'll have my down again for another day, good gracious, you know what I mean? Mm. I'd go to see them. Oh yes, eh? I won't stop with friends. <sighs> Dreadful thing stopping with friends. You see, if you stand by yourself in a hotel thing, you can... You can, uh, you can, uh, you can believe practically yourself in the bedroom, can't you? You yeah. can't be friends, can you? Well, not, not very easily. No. It depends who the friends are. No, I couldn't do that way. <laughs> you said you, that your greatest friend was killed when you was in the First World yeah, War. Yes, that's him up there. Do you remember his name? Yes. Oh, yes, I remember his name. That's a while ago, isn't it? 1919. Yes, he killed an Ajeen. Yes. Was he a family friend? Nearly. You could call it that, yes. Mm -hmm. He'd gone right through the war without anything happening to him, only one leave in the four years. And then about a, about a few days after the thing was over, they got word he'd been killed in the last day. Thank you. Anybody want to make any comments? Or? If you do, you'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah. I, I am very surprised, it's me. Yeah. I'm very surprised to, to see the clarity of the pictures on the screen. And the first house that you put, the very old building, it was like a photograph rather than a painting. It was you know, really good. I'm quite impressed. <laughs> okay. Right, so we'll say a bit more about why Lowry did paint the industrial scene. In 1909, um, Lowry's father's business failed and the family had to move to a smaller house at 117 Station Road, Pendlebury, then a highly industrialised suburb to the northwest of Salford. This was the period, as you know, when the Lat Lancashire cotton industry was at its most flourishing and prosperous. Within a short radius of Station Road, there were many cotton mills whose workers would pass the Lowry home at half past five in the morning, their clogs clattering on the paving stones. There were coal mines also only a few miles away. This dark industrial landscape in which Lowry suddenly found himself was in complete contrast to his former surroundings. And it's at this time that he took up painting seriously. He told me that he disliked his new environment intensely and described it as hell. He said, I didn't like it at all for a long time and I couldn't get used to it. Then I began to get used to it after a year or so. I began to be mildly interested because it was all cotton mills and coal pits, not like it is now. He said that he realised there was something compelling, unique and wonderful about this environment. This realisation came to Mr Lowry quite suddenly one afternoon in 1916, when he missed a train. It was the usual train which he took from Pendlebury to Manchester for the art school. He told me, I remember the guard leant out of the window and winked at me as the last coach disappeared from the platform. I was very cross about that. I went back up the steps, it would be about four o'clock, 
and perhaps there was some peculiar condition of the atmosphere or something. But as I got to the top of the steps, I saw the Acme Mill, a great square red block with little cottages running in rows right up to it. And suddenly I knew what I had to paint. When this happened, he, Mr. Larry wondered if anyone else had painted the industrial scene. He said, I couldn't understand why I had never seen the mill scenes painted seriously. I went into it carefully and found out that nobody had done it. So I thought, I'll try and put matters right and put the industrial scene on the map. He told me that his intention was to complete the task as soon as possible and then to join friends in the cotton trade in Leeds. However, this was not to be as the task that he set himself was to take him over 40 years. So he set about his mission of recording the industrial scene, spending much of his time wandering through the streets of Manchester and Salford, observing and sketching. And of course, his job as a rent collector helped with that. He worked in obscurity without recognition, but he claimed not to be interested in this. He said that his parents, with whom he continued to live, were sympathetic but not interested. It was not until 1921, when he was aged 34, that he first exhibited in public. The exhibition was held in the offices of the Manchester Ar architect Roland Thomason at 87 Mosley Street, Manchester. There he sold his first picture which you saw a pastel entitled The Lodging House. He sold it for five pounds to a chartered accountant in Manchester. His parents were apparently surprised that their son had so sold a, a painting. When the following year he sold a small painting, he said that his father remarked, if the boy carries on like this, there'll be no holding him back. Mr. Bernard Taylor, art critic of the then Manchester Guardian, reviewed the exhibition in that paper on the 31st of October, 1921. Larry's interpretation of the industrial scene was highly praised. To quote, Mr. Lawrence S. Lowry has a very interesting and individual outlook. His subjects are Manchester and Lancashire street scenes interspersed with technical means as yet imperfect but with real imagination. He emphasises violently everything that industrialisation has done to make the aspect of Lancashire more forbidding than that of other places. And ends by saying, if he can learn to express himself with ease and style and at the same time preserve his singleness of outlook, he may yet make a real contribution to art. Larry was very encouraged by this and soon afterwards met Mr. Taylor, who suggested that Larry could improve his paintings if he painted a lighter background. I think you saw in that first, uh, uh, well, it's a pastel, not a painting, the lodging house, that it's actually quite dark. It's not like what we're used to seeing, the typical Larry. So the industrial scene was such a grim, dark subject that it was instinctive to paint in dark, sombre colours. Larry told me that he felt very cross at this implied criticism and said, so I went and painted the industrial scene on a white background and thought that would pay him off. However, to his surprise, Taylor praised the new effect highly and the white background became a characteristic feature of Lowry's work. But public recognition and fame were still far away and he continued his work in comparative isolation recording the industrial scene. The years of the depression followed and the slow decline of the Lancashire cotton industry. Lowry said that some of his acquaintances were affected and found themselves in reduced circumstances. I asked Mr. Lowry a few times whether his recording of the industrial scene had a social purpose. 
In other words, to draw attention to the dismal conditions. He always denied this and said that he just wanted to make a record, put the industrial scene on the map. He said there was no public political significance in it at all. He was not a socialist and expressed great surprise when he found that I had voted Labour. We'll hear more of that in a minute. In spite of the economic gloom, Mr. Larry claimed that this period, in particular 1924 to 1932, was the happiest in his life. He was close to his parents, especially to his mother, who was now an invalid, and each summer they went to stay in Lytham St. Anne's. There he enjoyed the company of other young people and family friends. There was one girl there of whom he was fond and whom he said he might have married. I believe he painted her portrait and kept it in his private collection. Sadly, she died in an epidemic together with her brother and sister and with a few months, her parents. A number of other friends died at this time and the Lowrys didn't return to St Anne's for holidays. Lowry said, we had no reason to go there once our friends had gone. Friends make a place. It was these friends from holidays at Lytham whom he seemed to recall with greatest affection. In spite of telling me about the young woman, Mr Lowry also told me, I never regretted not being married. In fact, I have been thankful once or twice from what I have seen of others. Absolutely thankful. He said that he had never been in love. During this period, Larry exhibited work with the New London Art Group and at the Salon d'Automne in Paris. He was commissioned to illustrate a Cotswold book by Harold Timperley in 1930 with 12 drawings, the book being published in 1931, and he was paid £15 for that. He said later he'd only done it to please the author because as far as he was concerned, there was no redeeming feature in the Cotswold scenery. <laughs> he did visit the Cotswolds from time to time as his cousin May lived there. His first one-man exhibition was at the old Manchester University Settlement Building in Ancoats on the 25th of March 1930. It was very successful, although the work was only displayed for one day and many drawings were sold. The Manchester Guardian devoted almost a whole page to two rep reproductions of drawings from the exhibition. The review said, these drawings of Ancoats should enhance his name. Later in 1930, he exhibited with the six Manchester art clubs at the City Art Gallery, and the first of his paintings to be acquired for a public collection was sold. This was an accident which was bought by the Manchester City Art Gallery. His father died in 1932 and for the next seven years his mother became bedfast and completely ruled his life, demanding all his attention as, as I mentioned if you saw the, if you saw the film last year that uh, showed that. He painted at night after she was asleep between 10 and 2 a.m. He told me, I think you do even more work in a night than you do in the daytime, really. It's been pointed out that there are no shadows in Lowry's paintings. Was this the result of his painting by night, at night by artificial light? It might have been. He had a successful one-man exhibition of his paintings at the Lefebvre Gallery in 1939, where he sold 16 paintings, including one to the Tate Gallery, for just £15. It, it was only after this that his work began to be noticed and his fame sl slowly grew, but this was too late for his mother, the person he most wanted to please, who died in the same year. Some of Lowry's paintings in these years seem to reflect his loneliness. There were derelict buildings, wastelands, 
ruined shells of buildings. He was an official war artist and was a volunteer fire watcher. He said, after my mother died, I was at a very low ebb. That was when a friend took him on holiday to Berwick-on-Tweed. Larry said he wasn't keen to go, but he went and liked it and visited often and painted and drew there. And I, d I don't know whether any of you have been to Berwick-on-Tweed, but if you go, it's very interesting because they actually have a Lowry art trail and they take you past it. You, you go through the streets and you've seen a picture of his painting and then you, you, you see the actual house that you painted. So it's a very nice thing to do. In 1948, Larry moved to the Elms in Mottram, where I used to go and see him. I asked him why he moved there. He said, I thought I must have a change. I can't stop here in Pendlebury all my life. A friend of mine said, I know a nice house in Mottram, so I came here. Mottram was a nice little village then, you know, not like it is now. Here I am, high and dry. He used to complain that the house was ugly and uncomfortable, but he still stayed there until he died 28 years later. Oh, we'll have the next extract, Bernard, please. I saw the, um, I saw your, the first, that first painting that you said you, Lodging the first out. one, yes, Lodging, in yeah. the exhibition. That's right. Because that, that was, I was interested to see that because it was so much different than the ones I'm used to seeing. Yeah, that was the first, 921. Yeah, that was, that was a very, that's very dark. Yeah. Did you paint that as dark as oh, that? Oh yeah, that's or? a pastel. It's a pastel. I did them very dark in those days. Yeah. yeah. And then you changed Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got told by a critic. I said, that's just no use at all. Mm. So you have to get them lighter. When the arrest? Yeah. yeah. Was that an actual incident that you oh, saw? Oh, yeah, you know, I saw something. Yes, I couldn't have thought of it without. Yeah. yeah. Because actually, you put Police Street oh, that's as the name. But then, I've seen, but then since then, I've seen a Police in Street Manchester. in Salford. In Manchester. Police Street in the back of Kendall Mills. Oh, is it? But there's yeah. also one in Salford near yeah. um, where the old Pendleton Town Hall used to be. Has it been pulled down the Pendleton Town Hall? Yes. Oh, Lord. They are pulling things down, aren't they? Aren't there's they? a police street at the side of that. Yeah. And the friend that I went with to this exhibition wanted me to ask you if there was any significance in the man being arrested wearing a red tie. No, tell her not. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I was a conservative, did she? Yes. Well, I'm a conservative, you can tell her, but uh, that's wouldn't matter. How long ago was it? It's a date. The date of the picture. Nineteen twenty-seven. Yeah. Well, she thought there was perhaps some. Uh, tell her. She's very, she's very left-wing. You see. Yes, tell her that I'm a, I'm an out-and-out -out conservative. <laughs> I am, you know. Are you? Yeah. But. Uh, it was just a coincidence. But you don't have the same attitude as conservative as a lot of conservatives what? I know. What way? Well, you have a sense of humour. Well, haven't they? Some of them don't seem to have. <laughs> <coughs> Not the politicians. Well, they no. But may I imagine no politicians. No. No. The one, the one you had one, you have one, uh, which is political meeting. Yes. That, that one I liked. It's a very intelligent gentleman holding forth, wasn't it? Was that an actual meeting you went to? Yeah, I saw it. Who was that? Do you, do you remember? Oh, it's a long time. What was the date of it? 1953. I can't remember that, 20 years ago. Somehow, I forget where it was now. Ah, yes. You're a Conservative too, are you? No. What are you? Anything? Socialist. Are you really a Socialist? Yes. Well, I'll forgive you. Will you? Yes. You don't mind me having, having me in the house? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll forgive you. Because mm. it was always, my, my grandmother was a conservative and she always was very ashamed of the fact that I was a socialist and she said she wouldn't tell any of her friends. Did she? And, and I hadn't got to broadcast the facts around. And you did, of course. 
Well, no, I tried to. <laughs> Well, there was, yes, now there's one that you painted, this one, Man Looking at the Sea. Do you know which one? I know, oh, yeah. Oh, by me. Well, he's, he's standing with his back yeah. to the, yeah. to when you look yeah. at it. But the way you've painted his hands, it's almost impossible to stand like that. Is it? Because well, if you yeah. have your hands behind your back... You'll have to forgive me. Well, I, I wasn't if there was any significance in it. I think it's something's pointed that out to me. It's just a slip. You have your hands <coughs> like that, don't you? You'd have them like that. I can't remember. But you've got them like that. Have I? Well, that's very careless of me, isn't it? Will you forgive me? Yes, but I just wanted to... I thought there might be some significance. No, no significance. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very, very sorry. Yeah. Uh, the one entitled The Empty House. Do you know, remember that? It was a sort of... Red house. Derelict house. Yes. Do you know where that yes, was? Yes, it was in Gatley. For a long time I've not been in Gatley empty. Rather forlorn, yeah. You had, again, this, it says that you had you had some private lessons in painting from William Fitz yeah. in Manchester. Yes. Who was he? A gentleman who was a very good portrait painter once upon a time in America. And he descended down scale. And he finished up at uh, in an all Alexandra Road. Had a, had a bit of a room there. A room was there. Lived there. Had a studio there. And he was a very clever man. Mm. Taught me a lot. Gemma, gen, trained in Germany. Get to know him. Oh now, how did I get to know him? By the ballet the teacher at the Royal School of Art. Oh yes. You were very interested in portrait painting Who? then, you? Yes, I was interested in portrait painting until I went to live in Penlury. Mm. And the industrial scene got me, you see, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Do you support any football team? Me? Yes, no. or have you done? No, how was Georgie Best going on? Well, he's supposed to be playing for them, and he's supposed to be playing for them again now, next season. Very unwise, isn't it? Well, he's what? He doesn't seem to know his own mind. Does no, he? does he? No. But I, I don't know what's happened. I mean, presumably he'll be fined by them for yeah. just going off. Yeah. No, it's just called Football Match yeah. 1953. That's one that's owned by Lord Rose. Yeah. I knew he had good ones. <coughs> How do you know that? Well, I like them all. Well, I mean, they're all good. Yeah. But He's got some very good ones. But that one was very good because when you saw it, there were lots of the sort of people going in. They were they made a pattern almost, the lines. Well, well they did, you see, really. They coming in from different directions. You've got to have a pattern in it, haven't you? They've yeah. always got to lead somewhere, haven't they? Those crowds are not as easy to do as you're thinking, though, because they've all got to have a point of interest. Yeah, I mean, it's not just a hot oh, pot. No, it, it must be very difficult. It isn't easy. No, it's not very easy. Is it? No. Yes. yes. According to Mr Molyneux, do you support Manchester City? I did, yes. I'm interested in it a bit, you know. Does he say that? Let me yes, I'm a Manchester City fan. I never go. Did you ever go? Well, once or twice, a few times, yes. In fact, I went as recently as 1938. Yes, I started to do it about 1990, after the First War. Mm. Was, yes, now. And I, I began to wonder whether anybody had ever recorded it, had done it. And I found they hadn't. So I said, I said I'll, I'll, I'll try and do it if I, if I can. And then when I, if I think I've done it, I'll get up and join some friends in business. I didn't join the friends in business, you see. It took you so long to do it. Well, and then just times had changed and I got rather not fond of work, to, which was perhaps in those days. 60, 60 years, over 60 years ago, was um, perhaps one of the most industrial parts of this country. And it, I disliked it, I got used to it. Then I got to like it, and then I got fascinated, and then we got to think I'd put a try to put it on the map if I could. So that began. Why did you move to Pendlebury in the first place? Super father. Why was that? Well, business. Just suited him. I wanted to go. Did yeah. your mother want to go? No. I was very glad we went. 
I'm afraid I haven't really got any of them. Nah, you're a socialist. This is very dreadful, you know. Oh. Why? Oh, it's dreadful. Why? Terrible. You're not really a socialist. Yeah. Share and share alike, you believe. You share a thing if you got it. Sometimes, not always. Ah, yeah, I, I don't always live up to my principles. I know, nobody does. It's very difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just couldn't be a conservative. Why? Now tell me why, as a matter of interest. What is the fearful thing about being a conservative? Um, well, the attitude that, well, I suppose my, let's say, why I'm a socialist, I suppose my, being a socialist for me stem, stems mainly from thinking about people and also from uh, Christianity. How do you mean Christianity? Well, to me, all of Christ's teaching. You know, I just, I just can't understand how it, well, that's a funny thing to say to you. No, but that, well. Don't, you know, don't take it wrong. Oh, how, any, how, any, how, any, how people can be, how you could be a conservative and believe in Christ's teaching. Because Why? Because he seems to... Well, because all along he's, he's showing how you should be concerned for other people. Oh, yeah. And lift, hmm? You can be concerned for other people. I'm concerned for other people. Yes, I know you are. But, uh, well, what, what, what can you do well, about it? If everybody had the same amount of money today, given them, there'd be big discrepancies in a week's time. You can't make people not equal, you're not all the same. You can't judge, you can't say share and share alike, what I have is mine and what you have is mine too. You can't do that, people are all different, you see. Well, I quite, yes, well, I quite agree as far as that's concerned. I think it would be totally impractical yes. to do that. Well, but I mean, well, at the moment we have got certain socialist things in the state which say countries like America haven't got like we've got a national health service. Yes, that's right. Well that's I mean you'd agree that that's a good thing. It's a very good thing. But that but I mean that was brought in because of socialists not because of the Conservative Party. Oh, it's a very queer place the world. Hmm. It's a very very queer place. It's just human nature I suppose. Yes, yeah, human nature. The lowest form of animal life of the human the only uh, the only uh, species of the humans of the of the animal life that kills itself wantonly kills others. Here we are back again. Yeah, thank you. Any any comments or questions? Yes, uh, I want to ask you, Angela, if um, if he was a religious man. Uh, if you mean by that, did he go to church? I think the answer is uh, no. No. I, I think he might have had to, he, he believed it. I think we did have a conversation about God. He did believe in God. Oh. But I, don't, I don't think he practiced it much. No. I mean, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. He, he was a good Christian, I suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, yes, I think um, the main question is really that he did have that sensitivity. And I, I question where that came from, and it probably was from his training, I imagine. What, what do you think, Angela? Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't think many artists uh, train for as many years as he did. And, and people... Um, I think a lot of people are surprised that he did do such a lot of training and, and trained in tr a, tradition, a very traditional way, didn't he, to start with. Um, I, um, I, think he, I think if you look at his paintings, he only uses a certain range of colours, doesn't he? Um, I ought to be able to tell you what those are, but I'm afraid I can't at the moment without looking it up. But I did read that that there were only certain colours that, that he used in the paintings. I've got Philip and Tony wanting to ask questions. Anybody else? Because I can't see everybody. Thank you. And Nakib. Okay, Philip, then Tony, then Nakib. Philip? Seeing the road surface there, 
reminded me that we call them sets. We've always called them sets, never couples. Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have known that. Sorry, I must have. Yeah. Hey, Tony? That's better. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wondered if you ever found out and, um, who the soldier was, uh, his friend who died in the First World War. No. I think I, I think I was I was always I don't know, although I was going and asking him all those questions, in a way sometimes I felt quite very awkward in, in sort of seeming as though I was prying a lot. Yeah. And so I mean listening to that uh, little extract before, I thought, well why didn't you say when he, when I asked him, Do you know who it was? and he said yes. Why didn't I say, Oh well can you tell me the name? But I think I was being too polite. Ah, right. It is a bit intrusive, I suppose. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, yeah, I just want to say that was really wonderful, uh, Angela, because um, I, I, I learned quite a lot about him, and he's so complicated, isn't he? He, he loved uh, the pre-Raphaelites, but he was, um, his painting was very kind of down-to-earth. And um, he says he's not a socialist, and yet... Um, he celebrated working class culture and, and showed yeah. how wonderful it was. And I, I thought, I think you had a lovely relationship with him. You're better than Michael Parkinson. <laughs> I mean, I think I, well, um, I wasn't experienced. I wasn't very experienced. I did start off by writing a whole um, series of questions in categories. But then I think as, as you see, as we went on, we became, uh, it became more of a kind of almost friends talking um, and um, yeah perhaps I didn't do it um, well anyway I'll say at the end why I didn't do anything with it um, right so we're talking about now really from the 1950s to the 1970s so uh, as we said his paintings began to receive recognition from the mid 1950s he stopped doing the mill scenes in 1965 and turned to seascapes he spent a lot of time in Sunderland he loved it there staying regularly at the Seaburn Hotel and the staff there became his friends the seascapes I think we saw one earlier are very bleak he also painted down and outs he encountered in Manchester and I think he was quite fascinated by these people he met a number of them in Piccadilly Gardens. He said, One man used to come into the gardens with a paper in his hands. Terribly sad, he would look at the clock and then after a time he would get up and go away for about 20 minutes down Portland Street and then he would come back. He did that three or four times a week. Then one day he came and sat on my seat with, a paper, with the paper in his hand. And he said, I think it'll be all right, you know. I said, I'm very glad. Yes, he said, they said they'd write to me. I think it will be all right. I talked to him all the time. His whole life was spent trying to get a job. Larry also spoke of a lady there dressed in black with an evil looking face, a tall gaunt figure who used appalling language. He said, she must have been a student of professional football standing behind the goal. I feel very sad about these down and outs, he said. I want to know how these people got in the position they're in. They are nearly all cultured people. I do not know how they did it. I feel dreadfully sorry for them. Lowry did have a great empathy with these people, which can be seen in his work of the time. Like him, these people were isolated. He was a great admirer of Henry Mayhew, who wrote London's Underworld and had a copy of his book, which he lent me. Um, as far as being re recognized, he received a number of honorary degrees, but he declined all the honors that were offered from the country, such as a knighthood and member of the companionship of honour. He apparently has the record of being the person who has declined the greatest number of honours offered. 
He was elected as an associate member of the Royal Academy in 19, April 1955 and became a full Royal Academician in April 1962 when he was 75. I think he felt that it had become it had come too late for him that recognition. In 1964, when he was 77, the Halle played a concert in his honour, and the Prime Minister Harold Wilson used his painting The Pond as his official Christmas card. But as I said, he felt that all this had come too late. However, I was involved with two of the honorary degrees, as in 1975, he was awarded DLITs from the University of Liverpool and the University of Salford. I was privileged to be at the Salford degree ceremony and to be with Mr. Lowry behind the scenes. Even more exciting was my involvement with the Liverpool degree ceremony, as without me, it probably wouldn't have happened. By then, I'd changed my job and I was working at, um, at UMIS in the city centre. And one evening, I went to see Mr Lowry and happened to notice on the table, as I said in his filing system, this letter from Liverpool University. Uh, offering him an honorary degree. So, I, I don't know, maybe we were sitting at the table. So I said, oh, are you going to reply to that? Are you going to accept it? So he said, oh, well, uh, do you think I should? <laughs> and, um, but I don't want to go to a degree ceremony. I'm not going to go. So um, it just happened that I knew someone, I had a colleague at, at Liverpool University, and I happened to be going there the next week. So I said, well, I can speak to my friend and see whether or not you actually have to be there. Maybe it's not necessary. So he was happy to go along with that. So I did do that. And then the next thing was that I had a letter from the registrar at the University of Liverpool saying, well, we'll be very happy to visit um, Mr. Lowry and convert, confer the degree on him in his house. So, you know, can you arrange that with him? So I did. And um, a number of people from Liverpool, the, um, the Chancellor, sorry, whose name I've forgotten, but he was from the University of Oxford, the Vice Chancellor, Registrar, I think the University Chair of Council, they all came. And in a minute, you can see a photograph of of, um, of, of us all in, the, in uh, Lowry's sitting room. And then it was very nice because we all went to the um, Midland Hotel after that for lunch. Um, so it was a very nice, uh, it was a very nice occasion. And uh, I always remember driving back to um, Mottram with Mr. Lowry in the car and uh, along the A6, the Stockport Road. And um, he said he wanted to go to the bank. So we stopped at this particular bank. And I always think of that, it's not a bank anymore. In fact, I think it might be a small carpet warehouse, but I always think of him every time if I go past there um, about he, how he stopped and we went, we went to the bank. That's, the, that's his standing in his sitting room. And there you can see the two uh, Rossetti drawings and also the one of the yachts at, at Lytham. Now that was the one in the film um, that his mother actually liked, if you remember. Um, and Larry, I think probably because his mother did like it, he always kept that. This is... This is the conferment of the um, of the degree from um, DLIT from the University of Liverpool, and it's good because you can see his uh, his room. So there's Lowry sitting talking to the Chancellor of the University. The Vice Chancellor's behind with his hand to his ear, trying to listen to what they're saying, and. That's me with the long cloak, which my mother had made me, um, bright red, so I was like Little Red Riding Hood. 
with the registrar and pointing out some pictures. Uh, you can see the grandfather clock. You can see behind the two gentlemen on the left, um, portrait of his mother. And um, you can see the yachts. The drawing, the drawing just be to the right of the vice chancellor is one of this mysterious goddaughter, Anne. Um, and next to that, you can see a little bit of the portrait of his father. And also underneath that, um, this was a, an early drawing that he'd done of his mother sewing. Yeah, this, this was quite an early drawing he'd done, which, which he liked and which he always, he always kept. Yeah, that's, that's him in, um, in Pendlebury. Is that the Acme Mill in the background? Possibly, possibly. One, there's the sulphur degree ceremony. Well, it's, <laughs> that's waiting to go in. That was in the council chamber. And as you see, he did go to that and was accordingly dressed, dressed up for the Doctor of uh, Liter Letters. And that, hat and that, yeah, it was a nice hat, that. It was, um, had yellow flowers on it. It was very nice. Um, if you go back to the, just to show that Seaburn Hotel, it was a little letter he sent me uh, saying that he was going to be away, so he couldn't, he couldn't see me. So, um, should we go on to the next? The uh, final excerpt. Yeah. <laughs> A young lady, she was getting, she was, she was a 12 at the time. I was doing a picture with some trees on it, the cricket ground. And she came with her mother, I was so up to how I was, you see, and she was about five, six years ago. And when she saw a picture with these trees around the ground, she said, Oh, Mr. Larry Gumpt, will you stop doing trees? <laughs> you can't do trees, can you? She said, Your trees are terrible. <laughs> So take those all those trees out, will you? I got me instructions or anything. Take all those trees out and put industrial backgrounds to it and it'll uh, come again next in a fortnight time and see what you've done. <laughs> <laughs> so did you? Yeah. <laughs> I said it was very good, you've been a very good boy, she said. <laughs> How old was she? Twelve. Well, somebody here. What? Was it somebody around here? No, somebody a friend of mine. I live a long way off here. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I was going to ask you about the one, the one in the Salford Arts Gallery, of the man uh, lying on the wall. I saw that. I like that. Yeah. When did you do that? Yeah, that was. Oh, you mean you actually saw a man? Yeah. Oh. About 1955 or six, I think. When was it you saw it? On the way to Accrington. I, I never, I always sort of thought it was something... Imagined? Yes. Oh, no. With his briefcase and umbrella? Yeah, he had an umbrella. His briefcase, his briefcase hadn't got LSL on it. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't know what he was doing there. <laughs> he was having a rest, he was a nice chap. On the top of a very wide wall, oh, as wide as the top of that table, and length for his. He sat on the, lying on the top of a blessed of peace and quiet. Yes. Yeah. Cigarette in his mouth, yeah. And he was all right. On the main road, or? S secondary road? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was all right. They got a nice shelter, they don't care. No. Perhaps the science society ought to provide more for those sort of people no, and accept them rather than try and You take can't them. do anything with them. You can't do anything with them. They've got into that state and you can do nothing with them. Mm. The man who's applying for that job who sat on the seat with me and said he thought it would be all right. 
You was a jolly sight more satisfied with things than I am. See? There's a great compensation in life. It makes you wonder, though, what? what has happened to them to make them... Well, happy. something... Oh, yes. Yeah, something, something terrible. Yes, yeah, something... A uh, great shock, and they haven't been proof of... to stand up against it. They haven't strong enough to stand up against it, you see? That's what it's very sad. It's a terrible thing. Mm. Because things aren't as well made. Everybody's on the grab. Do you think they weren't when you, when you were... Well, life is slower, you see, you know, more. I think it's better in many ways now. The, the, the desperately poor people, and a lot of them are very poor indeed, you know. But they, now they're no happier now they've got a living, Alice. Um, this, this picture that you gave me of the, pres with procession, yeah. Yeah. can you remember a lot of these processions? Yeah. Manchester had one every Whit Monday, and on the Friday, the Catholic procession. And these towns, outlying towns, villages, had their own procession on whatever day suited them, you see. That was a Whit Thursday in Bolton Road, Penworth. The Protestant one. Oh, this, was this picture was. Yeah. Bolton Road, Pendlebury. It's all changed now, you know. What do you think? What do you think of um, the present women's liberation movement? Do you think it's a good thing that women should have more freedom? I think they've got as much freedom as they can get, haven't they? Freedom? Do you? I've had this out before. Well, no. Somebody else. I've had another young lady on with Tommy Track about yeah, women's, okay. <laughs> women's liberation. Well, what do they really want? Tell me. What do they want? Well, they want to be free to choose their own their, their career. Well, they do, don't they? Yes, but if then if you have children, it's not very easy because to carry on with a career, is it? Well, then, they, well, 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 if they have children, what's choose they going to do? You know, trade unions in Manchester and Salford. Do you come into contact with them? No. At all? No, not at all. Not in the unions. Not. It's about the general strike. Well, I didn't. I was. I was only a looker on at it. You see, I wasn't. I wasn't in it. It didn't affect me. No, but I mean, you might have gained some impressions of it. You have one of those drawings in the book was of a strike meeting. Well, you see, strike meetings, and you don't know what it's about, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you see, you do these drawings as drawings. Yes, oh yes. Mm. I don't think so. I didn't realise what bad times they were when they were here. This, this girl that you've done a lot of paintings yeah. of, is she a relation of yours? She's a very close friend, almost. A great friend of my mother's. Oh, yes. A girl there, sir. Yes. She's up there too. Yes. She's there too. <laughs> oh, this is this is her. Oh. Yeah. She's very lovely. Oh yes, she's a old friend of ours. Very close friend of ours. Mm. She's the one that's your goddaughter. Yeah, she's my goddaughter. Yes, here I am, and she's in writing with her mother. The she's father. Nowhere. The father died very suddenly. I was going to ask you. Yes. Was um, I've, I've seen the painting that Harold Riley did of you, the one sort of the back of you. Yes. How, how many people painted portraits of you? A lot, I think. Without me knowing. Well, or, or with you knowing. Well, a one. Oh, I don't know. I think one or two at the most. One, a young girl. She's a very distant relation of mine. Named Lowry. She lives in Rochdale. She's an art mistress. And she's very good if she likes, but she doesn't like work. I don't know where she's called that from. <laughs> and and uh, she thought she'd paint a portrait, but it's all bigger. One. It's bigger as the front of that thing, bigger. Mm. I have this, this article 
this thing that, that was in the evening news, I just kept it. Yeah. That thing about this woman, Pat Cook, and she claims to have done two portraits of oh, you. Oh, perhaps she had, I didn't know. It says when she was 15 and still at high grade. Oh, that's her. She did that in the corner. Oh, she did that one. That's me, in the far top corner over there. Oh, I was going to ask you who it was. Me, that. Where that me at the time. How long ago would that be? Ah, uh, 30... 20 years. Mm. Oh, that's right, it says... Mm. Well, she painted two portraits of Lowry and Oils at his home. One he kept, the other is hanging in her sitting room. Oh. Hey, dear. 1910. But that's the earliest drawing I've got, the one behind you, for a party of somebody seated in a chair. That's my mother, I did a sketch of her in 1906. That's very good, isn't it? I think it's all right, it's very like her. Yeah, very, very like her. Okay, it's well, weird, isn't it, going from, from, from that to back to Zoom again? I know. Um, well, I think... Before we have any questions, I'll, I've not got a lot, lot more to say. I'll just finish it and then we can have some questions. So, uh, Larry died of pneumonia following a stroke. He died at the Woods Hospital in Glossop on the 23rd of February, 1976, age 88. Sadly, this was just before a very big retrospective exhibition of his work at the Royal Academy in the autumn. He's buried in Southern Cemetery next to his parents. He left his estate to Caroline Lowry. You saw the girl in the uh, in the photograph. She was unrelated. He said he said in one of those extracts that she was related, but apparently she she wasn't. And she first met Lowry in 1957 when she wrote, age 13, for asking for advice on becoming a, an artist. He visited her at home in Haywood and then became a family friend. I was very privileged to have spent the time with Mr. Lowry. As I said earlier, he was a very secretive person and I know he didn't always tell me the truth because I can find contradictions in what he told me. He had a great sense of humor and an interest in humanity. He loved music. He said that Bellini was his favorite composer he liked to tell stories, not always accurate. He would have been very surprised at the popularity of his work today and the many items which are printed with his work, from mugs to birthday cards, tea towels to cal calendars. There was even a political cartoon in a recent edition of the Times which used his idea of the industrial scene. Shows how iconic he's become, but you, know, you may not have seen this. It was about Two, two weeks ago. So, why didn't I continue and write up the conversations? A number of reasons. Um, in 1974, I changed my job and moved to UMIS and had a lot more responsibilities. In 1978, I met Roger, who I married in 1980, and then had Michael in 1982, and my life changed. I also really thought that whatever I had wasn't good enough. As lo not long after Mr. Lowry died, a biography by Shelley Roder was published. And I thought, well, I don't really have so much information, not considering the value of the tapes in themselves. A few years ago, Bernard Leach found out about the tapes and arranged for them to be digitalized. He's been urging me to do something with the conversations ever since, and I've probably let him down by not, not doing that. I'm sorry about that, Bernard. <laughs> but I have to thank him for all his help in doing this today, because I think it would have been very dull if you'd only have me, had me talking, and I certainly couldn't have done all the technology that, that Bernard's done. So um, I think we're very grateful to you because that was really the uh, most interesting part of the afternoon. So thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you everybody for um, listening. And if you have got any questions, I'll, I'll try and uh, answer them. But I'm sure that some of you here know more about the artistic side of uh, 
Mr. Lowry, the, than I do. Yeah, um, Thank you, it's Henry Rack. Uh, Angela knows me. Um, <laughs> delightful and, and very revealing, I think, in many ways. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it makes, really made you think about what a fascinating personality. Uh, just a, a quick query. Those um, sea scenes, I remember seeing quite a lot of them, wondering what they meant, uh, whether it was his state of mind. You know, those grey seas, which he seemed to do a lot of. Um, did he ever say anything about... Um, what was in his mind about doing them? No, um, well, I think he he said that you know he liked the scene up there. He liked he liked it because he did he did paint some up in Sunderland, which did which were more in a way akin to the industrial scene he painted here because they yeah. had the boats. But I I think that and I suppose people art critics you know say. They tended to show it's like isolation because there were some of them. There was nobody, nobody there. Nobody no. there. Um, just and empty had, and grey. There's yes. one at the sea and a and a, a lighthouse. And again, it, I think that I think that's how I've interpreted them really. Mm. Any other questions? Just a, an observation, if I may, or a couple of observations. For, for those that didn't know, it was actually his birthday on the 1st of November. So that's five days ago. Yeah. Uh, and in answer to the, uh, the colours that he used, they were Winsor Newton colours. And I've posted on the chat the actual colours. He only had a, a palette of four colours. One was white, black, yellow ochre and vermilion. Sorry, uh, five colours included and, and, um, and Prussian blue. And he always kept it to Winsor and Newton and those colours, except there was one a, a painting uh, in his, his later days where, uh, from, as far, far as the story goes, he couldn't find some uh, Prussian blue. So he, he changed that one to a different blue. But uh, uh, anyway, it's just a, a little bit of fact for you. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Very knowledgeable. Thanks, Peter. Can I just be nosy? Later. Angela, and I ask you if did you ever manage to get close to him as a person? I mean, I don't mean a relationship, but I mean a rapport or, you know, did you ever identify with him? Um, I'm not sure that I identified with him. I think, I think, well, I think some of the conversations we had, I think, showed that, that we did. Um, he, he wasn't the easiest person probably to get to know um, yeah. <laughs> or to interview really yeah um, but it seems a very reserved type yeah I think sometimes I, sometimes when I was I'm asking things then yeah. what you got in reply was yes or no or I mean yeah. obviously there's you've just we had there were 20 hours of tapes and some of the I mean Bernard's listened to uh, quite a lot of them but I mean some of them are going over the same same ground and these are some of the most interesting mm -hmm. um, but I, th I feel that I feel that I did have a I did have a rapport with with me and with him rather and I think the fact that he was willing to mm. Sure. Yeah, sure that he had with me and things, then I think that came over. Yeah, yeah. What are you going to do with them now, Angela? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I am, um, yeah, I will, I will be in touch with the Lowry, I think, with the gallery and see whether yeah, they so might be interested. In them. Mm. I should, I, I need to do that, don't I? I've, I've still yeah. got, the, no, I think so. got the original, be. um, reel to reel, uh, tapes. I don't know what. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I mean, I, I, mean I, I, think, I think they are. It is 20 hours of unique recordings for somebody yeah. who is still well, extremely popular. Be. Could I ask Angela? Um, there's a, a range of styles uh, in, in Larry's work. One is like um, traditional, where he does quite, quite nice portraits, like the one of his mother, yeah. um, the one of his father. Uh, as an oil painting, it's very traditional. Did you ever query 
the change of approach where it became quite kind of caricature with the big boots and the silhouette figures and the white skies of the industrial scene. Well, I think it was his, I think it was um, his development, wasn't it? He, he, he started off, well, if you see some of his very early drawings, which I think <laughs> probably are in, in, the, um, in, the, in the Lowry, mm. then you, they're very, there's some very traditional uh, yeah. things. And then he did, the, he did the portraits. But then I think it's as his style developed. And it, I mean, it's, you can see from that very early one, the pastel, was it the lodging house, which is dark, and how that developed into the, as the years went on, into the, well, the, with the white background. But I think then he really changed again, didn't he? Because like the painting, The Cripples, where he tends to, um, he was concentrating on, I think, painting people. And showing how, I mean, that really, they showing how the people were all isolated from each other. They're all standing, aren't they? They're not in conversation. No. And, I mean, also, some of the... Um, the I think you must have heard about some of the drawings. I think they were drawings which were found after he died were of, of women were quite interesting because they were almost um well i don't know um, women who were almost tied up or in very tight clothing yeah sadistic yes yeah. sadistic. that's the word judith yeah <laughs> yes yes yeah wow. so that showed that that showed another side of him which probably kept uh, hidden of it yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, any final question? Because it's been going on for, we've gone on way beyond time. <laughs> okay, shall we, uh, shall we leave it there much. then? Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bernard and Angela. That's brilliant. Thank you. That. We've enjoyed thank you. it so much. Bernard, okay, absolutely. thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.